هذا القرآن يوحدنا لطريق الخير يوجهنا الله تعالى أنزله ورسول الله معلمنا ورسول الله معلمنا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Continue with our program Fiqh of Business Transactions and we'll talk a little bit about some in, in general uh, we were talking last time about contracts and today we'll start with uh, different types of contracts in Sharia so we'll be using different classifications every time we'll talk about certain classification based on something else now these are uh, these are types of contracts in general in Sharia because we have Al-Ahkam Al-Khamsa uh, the five rulings in Sharia, ah, the five famous ruling, al wajib wal haram wal makruh wal mubah wal mustahab. khamsa. These are the five uh, Sharia ah rulings that are used uh, in, in fiqh. So uh, the ulama they said there are some contracts that are mandatory. Marriage in some cases, in some cases, if a young person has the ability to get married. And he's concerned about his, uh, you know, he lives in uh, he lives in uh, in a non in a corrupted environment, and he's concerned about his deen. So marriage could be obligatory for him, could be mandatory for him. He has to get married, especially if he's financially able to get married. Recommended contracts like loans, giving a loan. And loans in Sharia, ah, as, a, as we said before, they are beneficial, charitable contracts. So we cannot ask any uh, return for a loan. When we give a loan, we give it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Expect the reward on the Day of Judgment. If you don't want to give a loan, then there are other contracts, other means of doing business and sharing the profit with the entrepreneur. And waqf is one of the rec recommended contracts. There are some other recommended contracts. Waqf is one of them. Uh, it's a, actually it's a great tool of, uh, you know, helping the ummah or promoting the the well-being, the economic of the ummah. But uh, it is not used uh, properly, and it was not used properly. But this is something that needs to be studied. Permissible contracts like sell and lease. Disliked contracts like selling someone. A grapes to someone who might use it to make wine. You are not sure. If you are sure that he will be making wine by this grape, then it's haram to sell these grapes to him. Vice versa, if you are buying something from someone. Sometimes we uh, go to some plazas or some malls, some places, and we find someone outside in the street selling something. People say that most likely he's selling it outside in front of a mall or something he might have stolen it, right? It might be, it could be a, a stolen item. So if you are not sure, it is disliked. We said it is disliked if you are not sure. But if you are sure that the guy have stole, has stolen this item, this merchandise, then it becomes haram for you to buy it from him. So this is the basic rule. You go to a place, you find someone buying something in the street. Here in this country, people have this impression that he might have, you know, uh, it might be stolen. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Forbidden contracts, interest-based transactions, forbidden sales. Uh, in, in this program, we'll talk about many forbidden sales, insha'Allah. We talked about some of them before. The two parties, who are the two parties? They are the two contracting parties, Al-Aqidan. And uh, the ulama, they said they have to have Al-Ahliya, the capacity to make a transaction. The capacity to make transaction. So they have to be sane, not crazy, not mentally ill. Uh, they, ha they don't have any mental illness. And they have to be mature. Mature, yani they have reached the age of puberty, but how about you know, transactions made by children. Now the ulama, they said, if the child is mumayyiz, not mumayyiz, mumayyiz is distinguished, brilliant. The mumayyiz is perceiving, has the power to perceive and to understand. 
as the ability to make transactions, especially when it comes to those little things, buying candy or ice cream or a bar of chocolate, then it, it is halal, it is permissible for him to make this transaction, but pending the approval of his guardian or his father. If his father is not happy with the transaction, he has the right to go back to the store and ask for the cancellation of the transaction. If he doesn't like it or he doesn't want, then it's a different uh, story. But Islamically, children are allowed to do these kind of transactions, you know, uh, but pending the approval of their, uh, their parents or their guardians. But of course, they are not allowed to make transactions about big things, like he cannot sell his iPad or the iPad of his father for $40 or $60. <laughs> you know, you cannot just come to a child, come to a child and say, you know, hey, let's make a business and then give him $20 for, uh, for an iPhone. Eh? This is not right. And you say uh, it was made by mutual consent and every, all the conditions of valid sale are there. No, I mean, uh, there is one condition that is not there. The child is not mature enough to make this kind of transactions. Owners of the subject matter, so both of them have to be owners of the subject matter. The seller has to own the, the, uh, say, the item of sale and the buyer has to own the price. Otherwise, it will be, uh, it will be a problem. You cannot sell what you do not own. Like methanin, if uh, methanin A owns a car and B comes to C and tells him I want to sell you this car and it's still under the ownership of A. So B cannot sell it to C because uh, B he's not sure that if A, if A will sell it to him or not. So you cannot sell it, you cannot just hoping that A will sell the car to you so you go and make a transaction with C if you are B. You know what I mean? Or Ahmed makes transaction with Ali hoping that Muhammad will sell him his car. And he gets the money from him and everything and he goes and he bargains make, trying to make a deal with Muhammad. You know, this is not right because you do not own the car, the car is not under your ownership, then you don't have the right to sell it. Bay' al-Fuduli, we talked about it. A Fuduli is someone who is your friend or family member. And a fuduli means in Arabic, it means someone who interferes with others' business. Fuduli. Uh, he was not asked. He was not asked to do this transaction, but he did it because he thought that it's a great deal. You were absent, you were traveling out of town, and he's your family member, his brother or your father. And he thought that, well, this is a great deal and you will never refuse this transaction. Uh, so we don't want to miss this customer. So he accepted the offer and he sold the car for him. This is Bay al fuduli So some two of the four Imams, I, I guess it's Abu Hanifa and Malik, they said it is valid pending the approval of the real owner. And the other ones said no, the sale is not valid because he sold what he does not own. Wallahu ta'ala alam. There is another, this is another classification types of business transactions. Of course, the non-commutative contracts are not business transactions. عقود التبرعات So, إذن في الشريعة عندنا عقود المعاوضات وعقود التبرعات عقود المعاوضات when people are exchanging items or counter values. Uh, exchanging money for goods or goods for goods or money for money. These are عقود المعاوضات. You know, you give something and you take something. المعاوضة is compensating for something. This is المعاوضة in Arabic. عقود التبرعات, is, they are based on donation, donating what you want. And there are different types, we'll talk about them, of donations in Islam. Commutative contracts, the first one is barter sale. When you sell something, it's called in Arabic بيع المقايضة. When you, you sell a commodity for another commodity. And uh, there is no problem with anything you sell except, and you are allowed to sell any commodity for another commodity except when it comes to the items or the commodities that are subject to the rules of what? The rule of what? The rule of riba. 
that are commodities that are subject to the rules of riba here you have to be careful so selling an old car for another car it's okay it's fine you sell a piece of land for another bigger or uh, uh, the location of the other piece of land is better that's okay even if your piece of land is bigger than the other piece of land so all these things are halal are okay are fine when it comes to the commodities that are subject to the rules of riba then you have to be careful selling within one kilo of date for two kilograms of date then from a, of a different you know quality and here these uh, dates are, are uh, a commodity that is subject to the rule of riba you cannot do it you have to be careful here the quantity has to be the same طيب, the second one is a spot sale al al hal so when you give and take on the spot you deliver the, your price and you deliver the item on the spot and, and you are you're free of any obligation you are free of any liability and the sale is concluded, this is called spot sale. Credit sale is Bay al Mu'ajjal, it's called al Bay al Mu'ajjal, credit sale or deferred payment sale. And uh, it has some rules, you have to ha agree on a deadline uh, of the payment. If there are, it is based on st installments, you have to agree on the times of the installments. And also, uh, uh, you know, there are some, some rules, there are some other rules that the ulama have mentioned regarding these sales. The exchange of money is called bay as sarf. And uh, bay as sarf here, it's very. Uh, we have to be careful when we exchange money for money. If the money belongs to the same de denomination, like you are exchanging Canadian dollars with Canadian dollars, you could do it. You have 20, a bill of 20 dollars in your pocket, and you want to use only one or two dollars. So you go to someone else and said, I need change. Do you have change? This is a transaction. If he is a friend of yours, and he has only fifteen dollars in his in his pocket. Can he give you this fifteen dollars and take the bill of twenty and tells you that I'll give you the other five tomorrow? Do you think it's halal or not? Hmm? It's halal? It's not halal. Yeah, look, it's, this is a very small transaction. And it is ribawi transaction. It is a usurious transaction. So when the, the money is of the same denomination, you have to do it on the spot and with equal amount, 20 for 20 dollars. If they, they are not the same denomination like US dollars, uh, exchanging US dollars with Canadian dollars, what will happen? It's okay, of course, the quantity doesn't have to be the same. Okay, exchange 150 for 100 dollars, it's okay, you are free. There is no limit on the profit. You don't have to look. I mean, if you want to buy, uh, sell them on the, with the market price, that's fine. But if you have your own price, that's fine too. We'll talk about the limits of profits because some people, they said uh, the limits, of, they, they have some limits. They have mentioned some limits for profit, 10% for this item, 20% for this, 5% for this. This has no ba basis in Sharia. We'll talk about it, inshallah. But here talking about a sort of exchanging money, the only condition that the Sharia is asking is it has to be, uh, the delivery has to be in the same trading session. It has to be on the spot. Rasulullah used to say hand to hand, hand to hand. They didn't have bank accounts, they didn't have this, you know, this uh, modern ways of transferring money and sending money. <laughs> well, we can, we can talk about these ways, but the basic principle is that the delivery of the money, the monetary units have to take place in the same trading session. You give him your Canadian dollars, he will give you your uh, American dollars. This is the basic principle. When we talk about al-qabd al-hukmi, constructive possessions, that's a different story. If you are exchanging with a bank and you have an account in the same bank, and the, instead uh, the teller did not give you your money, but the money was deposited in your account that this is called qabl hukmi constructive possession and it is halal and it has the hukm the same takes the same rule as physical possession so we have qabl haqiqi 
and we have the qabd al-hukmi physical possession when you get them in your hand and we have constructive possession when you have access to the the commodity you have access to your money you have access this is you didn't get it in your hand like you don't hold uh, or carry a truck in your hand or a car but if you are given the key or the car is in the garage and you have access to this garage so this is called uh, this is called constructive possession and you uh, and the car becomes goes under your liability it is in your charge and this is really important in our business to understand the dhaman mas'alat al dhaman liabilities because we have many problems in our communities and our community disputes between muslim brothers when they do business about this point especially when the uh, the commodity is distracted was it under your liability or my liability? Am I responsible for the damage or you are responsible for the damage? So we have many problems because this, uh, this concept is not uh, clear when we do our business transactions. Prepayment forward sale is called bay as salam It has its own conditions. You have to pay the, the price upfront and the, you have to agree on the deadline or the time of delivery of the commodity and you and the commodity has to be well described well defined and then you, uh, you give the price as i said today you receive your commodity after six months this is called bay as salam absolute sale or normal sale of goods for money is called in al mutlaq sale of goods for money so money for money is sarf uh, money for goods is al bay al mutlaq and uh, goods for goods or commodities for commodities is called al muqayada barter sale. Classification according to price. So when we look at the price you are buying with, we are different types, we have different types of sales. So we have buyu al amana and buyu al musawama. Buyu al amana, they are three types. Resale at cost price, which is called Bay'at Tawliya. Bay'at Tawliya, I bought it for five dollars. I'm selling to you for five dollars. So I have to be amin, I have to be honest. That's why it's called Bay'at Al Amana. Why would I sell it for five dollars? I didn't find any buyer. The market is very slow. I want to get rid of it. Simple as that. So I'm selling it to you the same price I got it. Okay? This is bay al tawliya The resale at cost price plus profit had a bay al murabaha Bay al murabaha became very famous, very popular nowadays in Islamic banks and Islamic institutions. We'll try to spend some time with it tonight, inshallah. Resale with loss, bay al wadi'ah, al wadi'ah or al hatita. So I got it for $5, I'm selling it to you for $4. Why I'm losing one dollar? Am I losing one dollar? I mean, I didn't find. Same reason. Market is very slow. When I get rid of it, clearance. I mean, people do it. They clear their merchandise all the time, so they make a discount. This is bay al wadi'ah. But here, al amana is you tell him that I bought it for five. I'm giving it to you for four or three. Bay al musawama, so you don't make any reference to the original price. Give me your offer. If I like it, I'll sell it to you. If I don't like it, I'm, I'm not going to sell it to you. Al amana is used, it used to be used in the old days. Bay al amana. Uh, people used to, you know, go for these options when they don't have much experience in the market. They don't know about the prices, they don't know about the quality of commodities. So they ask someone who is more uh, experienced, more, uh, you know, he has more knowledge about the market. They tell him, go and buy it for me, and then I'll give you a profit. Method and one of them is Bay al murabaha Non-commutative contracts or uqud al tabarru'at. So we have uh, a gift, hiba, and this is not a bilateral contract. Yani it's not made by two parties. Usually the statement is made by one person. I'm giving you this as a gift, hiba. 
Uh, usually people accept gifts, they don't return gifts. So, but it is a, a, uni, a unilateral uh, contract. Wasiyya, al wasiyya is when someone <laughs> is alive and he makes a will. Of course, when we include the inheritance, inheritance, ya ikhwan, is not part of the wasiyya. Inheritance was explained, ghuq al mirath, uh, the rules of exp uh, inheritance were explained, well defined in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we cannot change them. But the will, the wasiyya, we, ha we are allowed to make a wasiyya in one third, within one third of our wealth and property. So la uh, if we want to exceed one third of our properties, then we are not allowed, this is not permissible. And we cannot also make a wasiyya, give a gift. A wasiyya is it will be executed after you pass away. A bequest, it's called a bequest, after someone passes away. You cannot make a wasiyya to someone who is already uh, one of your family members who will be inheriting you when you pass away. La wasiyya taliwarith. There should be no bequest to someone who, uh, to an inheritor. Someone who is already among one of your inheritors if you pass away, then you cannot make a wasiyya to him. With one condition, the ulama they said, you can do it. If the rest of the waratha, the rest of the inheritors, accepted, are okay with it, are happy with it. Uh, so uh, otherwise, if they are not, then don't do it. It will be an act of injustice. And many people do it nowadays. MashaAllah, they divide their wealth before they pass away and they give their children different amounts of wealth. And this is not, this is not halal. Wallahu ta'ala alam. A waqf endowment, when you give a property for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this property will not be consumed, it will be uh, the, the profit or the return of this property, like mathan a building, the corpus of this donation will be used, okay? People will be renting mathan in this building, and the, the beneficiaries will benefit from the return or the income that is coming from this property. <coughs> so, مثلاً, you say, مثلاً, I'm making work for the orphans of Calgary, for example. And you give a land, مثلاً, and you rent this land. And you have another, you appoint someone who, is, who will be in charge of this work. Uh, and then the, this rent will be given to the orphans, all the orphans, Muslim orphans, who live in Calgary till, till the Day of Judgment. The orphans of Calgary, the Muslim orphans of Calgary will benefit from this, uh, this, you know, waqf until the Day of Judgment. There is another concept that is mentioned now or discussed in, uh, within the circles of fuqaha and ulama, cash waqf. Uh, and I would like to talk about waqf in the future, insha'Allah, to give a lecture about waqf, the history of waqf and the rules of waqf because we can use it, inshallah, in the future to help our students, especially our students. I feel bad for our students who are uh, taking loans, interest-based loans uh, from the government or from banks. And we have this beautiful concept and we are not using it. So inshallah, at least, I mean, I'm not going to talk about any project, but at least we'll talk about waqf. We, yani we, we have to uh, let people know about it and what are the rules of waqf and the beauty of this concept in our sharia. Al-ariya is a loan of usable items free of any charge. You give your car to someone, this is a loan, you are giving his car, your car for him to use it. Uh, and those are, yani, as I said, benevolent uh, contracts. Yani they are not, you, are not going, you, you cannot get any return for these uh, contracts. Loan, qard, qard hasan, القروض كلها حسنة في الشريعة أن الحوالة is assignment of debt uh, رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم used to advise people if they are not able to pay their debt to make a حوالة to assign their debt to someone else to a third party to a third party the, he become the assignee uh, you are the assignor and this concept actually the ulama Muslim scholars they said uh, the Crusaders got this idea, this concept of Hawala in the 12th century. And many of our uh, you know, instruments, 
financial instruments that are used nowadays in the banking industry, like checks, like uh, bill of exchange, uh, draft, bank draft, many of them are based on this concept of hawala. Because when you give a check to someone, uh, you are actually assigning your debt to someone else, to a third party. You're telling him that the bank will pay you this amount of money. And the bank, because you have an account, he will pay you, he will pay him from your money. But sometimes you might, uh, you might be, uh, you might go to someone else, a third party method, and something that many people do nowadays. You have a business and you get a check, you do something for someone, and you get a check, but it is postdated till the end of the month. But you need money. Or the owner of the, the check, the holder of the check needs money. He needs cash in his hand. And he has a check that is worth 5,000. So he goes to a cash store or uh, any other store, and then he will give him this check. Do you think the cash store will give him 5,000? He will give him most likely maybe 4,900 methan, for example. So this is discounting bills, right? This is haram. This is a usurious transaction because this is money. This check is money. And it was transacted for money. Uh, and the amount was not equivalent, was, it was not at par value. So this is haram, it's called khasm al awraq al tijariya fi al fiqh al islami. Khasm al awraq al tijariya. What are the basic rules? Can we leave the question till the end? I'll give you 15 minutes. Ma'am? Yeah, kafala is guarantee. If one someone a guarantor, when someone guarantees someone that if he is not his defaults on his payment, he's not able to pay, I will pay on behalf on his behalf. Aidan min uqud al ihsan. It is a contract of charity, and you cannot get money for this contract. You cannot guarantee someone for money. Okay. Uh, banks, Islamic banks, are doing it. They issue a letter of uh, guarantee. But they take, they said, we take only administrative fees. Wallahu ta'ala alam. They don't take a recompensation for this, you know, for this uh, transaction or this contract. But they said we are charging our customers administrative fees. Wallahu ta'ala alam. But it is al-kafala aqdun min uqud al-ihsan. Yani it is one of the charitable contracts. Wallahu ta'ala alam. We'll talk about warranty if you want, if you have at the end, inshallah, we can. The, what are now the basic rules of sale? We mentioned some basic rules of sale last time, but these are important for al murabaha If we have time to talk al murabaha otherwise we'll leave it till next uh, halaqa. The murabaha as a mode of financing, as a mode of financing. Not the, the not al murabaha al fiqhiyya the fiqhi, the regular murabaha that is found in the books of fiqh. Uh, in the books of fiqh, you know, you tell someone, go to the market, buy something, and then I'll, 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 I'll give you a markup, I'll give you a profit. You know, 10% or something. This is regular murabaha, this is normal, this is halal, there is nothing wrong with that. But the, the murabaha as a mode of financing, it's a different story, it's combined of different transactions. And it has many conditions, and many of the Islamic institutions, unfortunately, are not observing these conditions. And then it becomes, at the end, like a, an interest-based loan. <coughs> now, there are some basic of rules here, uh, basic rules of sale. The subject of sale must be existing at the time of sale. So you cannot sell the unborn calf of your cow to someone else. So when my, uh, you know, habal uh, al-habala, this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in his hadith that this is not a valid sale, something that does not exist. And number two, the subject of sale must be in the physical or constructive possession of the seller when he sells it to another person. I'll give you an example of uh, constructive, or constructive possession or physical, uh, physical possession. You are, you have a company or you have a business, you sell vacuums. And uh, you make an order, you made an order uh, for some vacuums to, to come from China. And uh, so now you bought this merchandise 
but the other party from China sent it to you. Okay, he has shipped it to you and he has taken care of the shipment expenses and everything, but you didn't receive it. You didn't receive it. So you cannot sell it before you receive this product because it is not under your liability. But if you had a representative or you have an agent, you have a company and you had an agent there who went to the company, to the Chinese company, and he inspected the merchandise and the sale was concluded, everything was concluded, and he shipped it himself on behalf of you. Now, it is under your liability and you possess this merchandise, you can sell it because it is under your liability. That's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa actually selling, I'll tell you about the differences between the fuqaha, and I hope you won't be confused. They would like to tell you these uh, differences just to find an excuse to the ulama. I would like to always find excuses for our ulama, because sometimes we complain about those differences, disagreements, without knowing the background of this disagreement. يعني selling something before it comes under your possession. There are different opinions, but the conclusion of this you know, controversy or these, these uh, disagreements, the Maliki jurist, the Maliki fuqaha, they said you cannot sell food when you buy it before it comes under your possession. Food items. Only food items. Why? What is their dalil? A hadith narrated by Imam Malik and Nafi' and Abdullah ibn Umar. This is a silsila al-Dhahabiyya. They call it the golden chain of narration. It's the best uh, you know, chain of narration. And this hadith is found in Imam Al-Muwatta and Imam Muslim and Sahih, al -Sahih Muslim. So he said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man bta'a ta'aman fala yabihu hatta yaqbidahu. He said, whoever bought some food, then he's not allowed to sell it until it comes under his possession, right? So the ulama, the Maliki jurist, they said, since Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has given us a specification, specified, he said these, uh, he mentioned the, the term food. So he said, then all the other commodities other than food, you are allowed to sell them before they come under your possession. Why? Because Rasulullah sallallahu mentioned the word food and if it was not, if it didn't have any meaning, then it would be useless. They said it would be, this is their argument. So fuqaha, this is how they analyze those, you know, texts. They said it would be useless to, to mention the word food. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa and one of his students, one of his famous students, Abu Yusuf rahmatullahi alayh, he said, you are not allowed to sell anything before it comes under your possession, except real estate. Why? Because they divide wealth into two, movable and immovable. So uh, anything that is movable, you cannot sell it before it comes under your dis, uh, possession, because it is subject to, to destruction, it could be destroyed, it could be damaged. But they said it's more safer to sell real estate because they are not movable, they are in their place. They are more sa it's more safer to sell them before you take their possession. And of course, real estate, you are not going to, as I said, carry a house in your hand. It's just when you are given the key, you will let, that means you possess, now it came under your possession. Al-Imam al-Shafi'i and Ibn Hazm and some other scholars, they said, actually, this rule applies to everyone. Applies to, uh, sorry, applies to every commodity. You are not allowed to sell it before to sell anything that you bought before you, uh, it comes under your possession. What is their dalil? Hadith Hakim ibn Hizam, radiyallahu anhu. He asked Rasulullah sallallahu Qala ya Rasulullah, inni abi'u hadihi uh, al -buyur. I'm involved in these business transactions and I buy and sell. مَا يَحِلُّ لِي مِنْهَا وَمَا يَحْرُمْ He said, what is permissible for me and what is not? So Rasulullah said, لَا تَبِيعَنَّ شَيْئًا حَتَّى تَقْبِضَهُ لَا تَبِيعَنَّ شَيْئًا Do not sell anything until it comes under 
your possession. So in this hadith, Rasulullah said anything. He didn't say food. Do not sell anything until it comes under your possession. And also there is another famous hadith, which is a great hadith. And uh, it should be, if, well, if this hadith is well understood, it should solve many issues in fiqh of business transactions. Rasulullah said, لا يحل بيع وسلف ولا ربح ما لم يضمن ولا بيع ما ليس عندك This is a long hadith but these are three main statements in this hadith. He said لا يحل بيع وسلف A condition of a loan combined with a sale is not permissible. What, it, what, what does it mean? If I rent some, something from someone or I sell to you something but I tell you at the same time, I want a loan from you. I will sell my car to you, but give me 2,000 loan. So we're combining between a sale and a loan. Why do you think this could be haram or it is not permissible? Because the seller will be tempted to give you a discount, so that's hidden riba. Allahu Akbar, this is the reason. The seller will be tempted to give you a discount Give you a good deal. Why? Because he's expecting a favor from you to give him a loan, right? Or you are renting him a house and you ask at the same time a loan from him. So you'll be tempting to discount the price of the rent because you are expecting a favor. So this is the only reason this transaction is not halal, combining between these two. You know, telling someone, I'm selling this to you, but I want a loan from you. So there is no transparency. There is no, the price here is not clear. It's combined between a price and, and a favor. Here, a loan. So that's why Rasulullah said, لا يحلو سلف وبيع لا يحلو It's haram. It's not permissible. ولا ربح ما لم يضمن Nor is the profit arising from something which is not under your liability. Ribhu ma lam yathman. You are not responsible for the damage. If there is any damage that happens to something, then as I told you, I was, I was mentioning the, the merchandise that is coming from China. If you have an agent who inspected this merchandise, and then he, the sale is concluded, and he, the agent, your agent, has shipped this merchandise for you. It is under your liability now. Because the seller has delivered his merchandise. Because there was someone else who was acting on your behalf. Then if there is something that happens to this merchandise in the middle of the sea, it is your, it is under your liability. But at the same time, Islam allows you to sell it. It is under your liability, but you can make profit from it now, before it comes to you, before you receive this merchandise. But if it is the other case, the seller has uh, you know, sold his merchandise to you, and you did not receive it, you didn't have an agent to receive it, and he sent it, he shipped it to you uh, in his way, and you didn't receive this, it didn't come under your possession. Now we're waiting for a physical possession. But the first one was kind of physical possession because this one, this person, this person who acted on your behalf, he actually received on your behalf this merchandise. Yourself, you didn't receive it in your hand, it didn't come in, into your warehouse, but it is called qabd hukmi, constructive possession, and here you are allowed to sell it and make profit. Ribhu ma lam yadman. So if you don't have, if it, something is not under you, your liability, you cannot sell it, you cannot make profit of it. If it is under your liability, you can benefit from it, you can make profit of it. Right? Well, that's why Rasulullah sallam he said, al kharaju bi dhaman This is another hadith. al kharaj is return or benefit or profit bi dhaman is linked to liability. These are major rules in business of fiqh transactions. So uh, anyway, you cannot, basically you cannot sell something that is not under your possession. And the subject of sale must be in the ownership of the seller at the time of sale. As I said, I cannot sell a car to a brother Fadi 
and the car is still under the ownership of Brother Ayub, hoping that Brother Ayub will sell the car for me. So I cannot do this. So, uh, you know, uh, this is haram. This is uh, not a valid, uh, you know, business transaction. Allah, I give you 15 minutes. I said 15 minutes. We'll pray five, five minutes after eight, inshallah. But the murabaha as a mode of financing, maybe we'll talk about it next week, inshallah. Tayyip, do you have any question? Fadl. Yeah, the ulama, they said it's an exception. The father is an exception. Not because of this hadith. They said because usually, naturally, a father is inclined to take care, to be keen to, uh, to take care of the, you know, the affairs of his children, to benefit them not to hurt them or, you know. So uh, they said this is a natural, this is, how, this is uh, you know, part of our nature as humans. We take care of our children and we take care of their business transactions if they are wealthy or they have money. Uh, so we give nasiha to them. So the father is an exception. They said if the father sells something on behalf of his child, uh, then it's okay, his, his sale is valid. Allah Ta'ala. Fadl. Is it permissible to um, <coughs> make requests from your uh, will? Like, for example, is it permissible to divide all your land as you want before you die? But, or is it not? To? Because I remember there's a hadith where the man approached the, the Prophet and said that, can I give this to my child as a gift? And the Prophet said, are you going to give us the children as well? Could you do that or not? You, you can't do it. You can't do it if there is, if injustice is involved. If you are giving them gifts, yeah. but uh, you are being just, you are giving gifts to all your children, giving money all your children, based on their needs, then it's okay. But we're talking about wasiya. There's a difference between giving a gift when you are alive and between wasiya. Wasiya will be executed after you pass away, after the person passes away. Here it has, Sharia has strict rules regarding the wasiya, the bequest. Because it will be... Now, the, with the only two rules, these are the rules <coughs> concerning wasiyah. Insha'Allah, insha'Allah, yani we, yani we have to clarify these rules in the future. Uh, the first rule is, your wasiyah cannot exceed thir the third of, your, uh, third of your wealth, property. And you cannot make a wasiyah to someone who will be inheriting you. Unless all the other inheritance, you know, you are inheritors, all of them accept and they are happy with it, then you can give him from your wasiyah. Allah Ta'ala. Um, if there is a deal and uh, one person sells something or one person wants a loan uh, and there is no discount, is it halal, halal or uh, is it haram as if there was a discount? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا يحل سلف ونبيع. He said, is it haram or halal if there is no discount? Yeah? No, Rasulullah he said, do not combine between them. Because there is a possibility. There is, even if you say, I'm not favor, making any favor to him, I'm not discounting the price, but there is a possibility. Okay? There are things that are haram, not because they are haram in themselves, no, because they might lead to something haram. Said the dhara'i, closing the doors of haram. So there are things that are haram, not because they are haram in themselves, but because they might lead to something else. So here there is a possibility that the price will not be transparent. Huh? That you may, might feel, okay, bad about it, and then you give him something. It will be riba. What if you or, or like Please, well, let me give chance to other people, because there are... Maish, I'm sorry. <laughs> When we send the money back home, it's not the same business day or business hour, but they get uh, one day or after, two days later. So is it okay? Well, it depends which way you send them. For, uh, Telegram or bank, by the way. Yeah, if you go to the bank, what will happen? Usually they will make the, 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 the transaction here in Canada. Give them Canadian uh, dollar. If you want to send, send Canadian dollars, there is no problem because you are sending money. They are making a service. They're just offering a service 
and charging you some fees for this service if they are sending Canadian dollars. If they are not sending Canadians, they said we cannot send Canadian dollars, we will convert your money into the other uh, currency. What will happen? This is a surf here. Now you are entering into a surf transaction. But it is happening in front of you, and they tell you about the rate, and the transaction took a place. Now, yes, you didn't receive it in your hand, but on your behalf, they are sending it. So this is a second transaction here. So there are two transactions. There is a surf transaction, and there is a, a sending or transferring money on your behalf. They are asking for fees. So the fees that they take from you, they are for the second transaction or the second service, sending money overseas. But the first transaction, it is halal. The ulama, they said it is halal, even though you didn't get the counter value in your hand. Because you got a receipt. In a bank or any company, you'll get a receipt. Transaction is concluded. This is qabr hukmi So they said uh, it is halal. It is halal because the transaction is concluded. You know how much they are selling. You call your parents back home, your family members, they will tell you, this is how much we got it. Actually, with Western Union, they will tell you it will be available within 10 minutes. In Western Union, they will tell you it will be available within 10 minutes. So they do the surf transaction. They tell you how much they are getting back in Pakistan or Lebanon. And then they take some fees for sending money, not for the transaction, for sending money on your behalf. So this is okay, this is fine. Uh, same related issue, like if I uh, get a loan from my brother let's say back home, so I need $100 and he paid like 4,000 rupees at the time that I got $100. Over the time, my Canadian dollar got stronger, and when time come to pay back, uh, I paid $100, but he's getting $5,000 or $6,000. Okay. So, yeah, so what he did, he went to uh, the bank there, and he gave them 4,000 rupees. Mm -hmm. You call them rupees? Yeah. Okay, and uh, the transaction was, or the result, end result was $100. Yeah. So he sent this, the bank on his behalf sent you $100. This is what you got, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So he made the transaction. Mm -hmm. He was the contracting party. You, you got a loan as $100. Mm -hmm. Then you, after two months, you send him back $100. Mm -hmm. But the, the surf you made at that time, the end result or oh, the counter value, the other counter value currency was 5,000. It's halal because you are sending $100. There is no riba here because you are sending $100. It's his $100. You are giving him $100. You know what I mean? I know. I know. I need 4,000 rupees and send me, I got $100. When I send it the back, the money back to him, he said, well, it's 4,000 uh, rupees, I send him $80, for example. Yeah, here, I mean, you are making a good question. This is a good question here. Tell how to solve this issue, this is a good point. You tell him on the phone, I need 4,000 rupees. So when he goes to the bank, he's your agent, he's your wakil. He is now exchanging the money on your behalf. Then you have to send him back 4,000 rupees. Well, if this is the case. You know what I mean? But if you tell him I need $100. Yeah. So it depends on the agreement? Yeah. It depends on the agreement. What kind of loan you are taking from him? You know, this is who's asked the question. You ask the question. If you tell him I need $100, this is your loan. And you have to return $100. Whether the, 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 he will get for this $100, 6,000 or 7,000 or 400, or less, 3,000 rupees. It's not your problem. You got 100, you gave him $100. But here in this case, he said, I want 400 rupees. Now when he goes to the bank and he said, I will exchange it on your behalf. You are acting on his behalf. You are his wakil. So you got 400 rupees, you return for him 100 rupees. It could be 400 rupees, uh, 4,000 rupees at that time, $90 or $80. So, but you gave him his money back. This is the. Yes. If 
father, he has married three, three kids. One of the kids become convert. He is not a Muslim anymore. He changed his religion from Islam to Christianity or something. Or he becomes so stubborn that the father is losing his faith for that kid. So still he will be... The, the father is losing his faith in that child. Especially he is making him believe to, to the society. That's okay. 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 We have two cases here. The first case here, when he becomes a Christian or a Jew or, or a Buddhist, okay, he's a non-Muslim. There is no inheritance between a Muslim and non-Muslim. So when the person passes away, his non-Muslim child will not inherit from him. If his non-Muslim child passes away, the father as well does not inherit from him. There is no inheritance between a Muslim and a non-Muslim. But if he is, the father is losing faith in this child, like he's losing hope, he's not praying, he's not doing that, uh, so then uh, he's still Muslim. If he's still Muslim, then if the father passes away, even if he's a fasiq, a sinful Muslim, he still have the right to his, his share. is reserved, protected. Share of inheritance is protected. Okay? Because we cannot just pick and select and say, I'm not happy with this child. Huh? <laughs> They're out. And I give all my money to these children. They go to the masjid and they pray and everything. Cannot do that. If we open this door, we open a door to a big mess in our society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was very strict with the laws of inheritance. He didn't tell us uh, how many rak'ahs we pray in Asr and Dhuhr, or Maghrib or Isha. He knows that we will follow the Prophet وسلم. We will not dispute, have any dispute regarding that. But when it comes to money, he knows our desires and our problems and our weaknesses. And he told us how much the mother gets and the father gets and the mother gets and the children and uh, details in the Quran and we are not allowed to change them. The last question. Tfadda uh, So there are businessmen who look at the assets of their children and they say they just have the design. They have what? Design of the architecture of that building. Okay. So nothing is built here. They just own the land. Can they sell yeah, this is, brother is asking, some contractors did not sell, uh, did not build the building or the house or whatever. But they have designs, right? We call them designs? Blueprints? Drawings? Not drawings. They are small uh, models, small models. Now these models will give the customers full description. And then they will have more information, detailed information about these houses and everything. This is called Aqd al-Istisna. Aqd al-Istisna. Al-Ahnaf, may Allah have mercy on him, they said it is a valid Aqd contract. There are some other scholars who don't agree with them, but it is now adopted and well accepted in Islamic finance, Aqd al-Istisna. You make an order for something, it will be made for you, to be built for you, but all the description has to be given to you. So you make your contract based on this full description. And uh, in Aqd al istisna you don't have to pay the money up front. It could be on installment, but Aqd al salam is different. You have to pay the whole amount up front. If we have time, cannot make many promises. If we have time, we'll talk about these sales briefly, inshallah. But next, I think next halaqa, uh, would like to co for, uh, cover murabaha as a mode of financing. And also I'm interested in those contracts that are used in selling houses in North America. Diminishing musharaka or ijara combined with loans and those things. The way some Islamic, I'm not going to mention any company here. I don't want to mention any company, but I will talk about concepts and rules inshallah because many people are asking about those contracts or agreements that are made by some Muslim institutions and many Muslims are not comfortable with these agreements we'll say we'll talk about them inshallah in a halaqa uh, before we finish this program tayyib jazakumullahu khairan subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik